In this video series, I'm going to talk about all things tropes, what they are, how to use them, and how to hook readers. Coming right up. Tropes. We don't talk about them much in the writer community, but they're the invisible glue that holds our storytelling together. You can't tell any story without using a trope, and readers expect them in every book they pick up. What is a trope? A trope is defined as a significant or recurring theme or motif. In other words, it's something that pops up in the world of storytelling over and over. The way I define it is that it's a unit of storytelling, kind of like a Lego. Stack a ton of those together and you have a story. That's because a story consists of dozens of tropes minimum. There are plot level tropes. Boy meets girl, hero's journey, hero lost during a trip and has to travel through a strange new world to get home. Those are plot level tropes. There are character tropes too. A stock character such as a hooker with a heart of gold or a space pirate, those are classic character tropes. The strong female heroines you see in so many urban fantasies and paranormal romance are also tropes. But character traits can also be character tropes too. For example, a scar on the villain's face, that's probably something you've seen before. Or a character who is the chosen one who has some sort of physical characteristic that makes them able to save the world, that's another classic character trait trope. There are also narrative tropes too. Like the fact that whenever you have an airship or some sort of aerial device that the heroes are traveling in, it always seems to crash. Or how the hero visits a small town where everyone knows everyone's name. So when you think of tropes, think bigger and think wider than just characters. It's plot, it's character and every little detail in those characters' lives, and it's story. A trope differs from its evil cousin, the cliché. A cliché is a trope that is used over and over again to the point where it's no longer original. But tropes, in and of themselves, are neutral. Don't knock the trope. Knock the author who used it poorly, because this game is all about execution. If you're a beginning writer, avoiding cliches should be your number one goal. But that's a topic of another video. Tropes are also genre agnostic. You can use a trope in any genre. And if you look at many breakout bestsellers, it's often because they brought unfamiliar tropes into a new genre. Harry Potter, Twilight, Hunger Games, The Girl with All the Gifts, those are just a few that come to mind. The key with tropes is not to think about them, really. Just tell the story you want to tell, and you'll find that all the tropes are there later waiting for you. But as writers, it's important to break this stuff down so that you at least understand it. Knowledge is power, but before I go further, I need to tell you that with great power comes great responsibility. What you're about to see in this video can be used responsibly, or it can be used for the wrong reasons. If your goal is to be a long-term professional writer, like mine is, then I have no doubt that you'll be responsible. But if your goal is to simply write to market and make money, you're in for a world of hurt if you use the tips in this video out of context. You've been warned. You can do one of two things with any trope. You can keep it familiar or you can subvert it. For example, if you have a character seeking revenge for the death of someone he cared about, you would be sticking to the revenge trope by keeping it familiar, right? But what if the character was seeking revenge for the death of someone he never met? That would be different. Keep your story too familiar and readers will check out. Subvert every single trope you can think of and you'll have a story that's practically unmarketable. In my video on writing to market, I talk about the need to find the intersection between art and commerce. Tropes are the hidden secret. But how do you dabble with tropes without losing your shirt, you ask? If you think about a story as a series of tropes, here's the best way I have found to explain it. Think of a story like a funnel. At its widest opening, it catches the most people. So the tropes that are most visible to readers should be familiar, or at least they should seem familiar. As readers move deeper into the story, that's when you can start subverting more and more tropes. You hook readers with a familiar concept, and then as they move deeper into the story, you give them your artistic flair. For example, with my upcoming fantasy series, The Last Dragon Lord, the book is about a fallen dragon lord seeking revenge against a conspiracy that betrayed him. That's a high-level description of the plot, but it's much deeper than that. What are the tropes at play? A dragon, for starters. That's familiar to fantasy readers because fantasy readers who love dragons love dragons. He's a dragon lord. That's slightly unfamiliar, a little intriguing, and even more so that he's fallen. A fallen character is a classic trope and familiar to readers, and pairing it with revenge is also familiar. Now here's the secret sauce that will make you dangerous if you use it correctly. The key? Start executing on the tropes before readers even read the story. It starts with your book cover. In my case, I put a dragon on it, and through color, typography, and the background, you get a feel for the mood of the story. Clearly it's a dark fantasy. Can't unveil the cover just yet. Then in the book description, I set up the Dragon Lord and the revenge aspect. Then in the first chapter of the book, in the sample that readers can read, I deliver. The reader sees my Dragon Lord at the height of his power just before it all crumbles. However, as readers move into the story, they slowly learn that this is not your typical dragon story. Not by a long shot. 
but I don't start pulling major punches until around the 15% mark, just after the sample ends. But when I do, I start subverting tropes in a big way. And I'm confident that readers will stick with me because I did the work in the beginning to keep them hooked. So, many of you might be asking, Michael, in the beginning of the video, you told me to ignore tropes, and now you're telling me to pay attention to them. Yes, I am, and no, I'm not. That's because you should ignore the tropes when you're writing your book, but they become immensely important when you're marketing. With the last Dragonlord series, I wrote the story I wanted to, and I didn't think once about tropes. But when I finished, I took stock of what I had, and I figured out which tropes would resonate with readers the most. Those determined where the book fit in the marketplace and how I marketed it. See why I said you need to use this power responsibly? A lesser author would go to Amazon's bestseller lists, they'd buy the top 20 books, read them and dissect what tropes they used, and then write a book using those same tropes without subverting them, or they'd subvert them just a little bit as to be slightly more recognizable. Then they would try to make their book look like all the other books on the market without being original with their writing. But that's not the secret. The secret is writing the story you want and then finding out where your highest level tropes intersect with the market. Then you make a book cover, book description, and a sample that fits in with the market. But you don't change the story. If you use tropes to modify your story to make it more marketable, you've fallen into the trap. If you want to supercharge your trope knowledge, visit www.tvtropes.org for a repository of tens of thousands of tropes. It's my go-to resource, and as a storyteller, it's one of the most important tools in my toolbox. Seriously, when I visited this site for the first time, I'll confess that it scared me because I used to think that if I used a trope, I wasn't being original. I'd be on a page and you know, I'd think, oh crap, somebody already did this trope. You know, That's actually not true. Remember, you can't write a book without a trope, and it's about how you use it. When you use the site, think of it instead as a reference, and this is the superpower that most people ignore on, on tvtropes.org. Whatever is listed on a page for a particular trope is exactly what readers expect, with tons of examples from books, movies, television, and all kinds of other media. Use it like a farmer uses the farmer's almanac, or how a fashion designer uses a lookbook. It's a guideline, not a rule, and you should deviate wherever you feel necessary, but it will help you keep your finger on the heartbeat of what readers are expecting, and what kinds of stories and, and characters and tropes that they've already experienced when they're coming to your book. You know how in the author community we keep talking about reader expectations, but no one actually defines what those are? Well, they're all right here on tvtropes.org. It's a smorgasbord of reader expectations. All you can eat, really. Everything you read on this site is a reader expectation, with clear tips on how to meet or subvert that expectation. Few writers I know think about TV tropes in this way, so this will be a superpower, like I said. Most people think it's for television only, but it covers books too, so don't worry. So that's a crash course in tropes for you. Use them wisely, and don't forget to be an artist. If you haven't seen my video on Right to Market, be sure to watch that, pair it with this video, and you'll be dangerous. That's it for this video. If this is your first time watching, I'd love to have you subscribe. And if this video helped you in some way, do me a favor and share this video. Thanks for watching.